Hello, I'm Ivana Lynch, but some of you might know me as Luna Lovegood from the Harry Potter films. I'm here to present a special lesson at Warner Brothers Studio Tour London, The Making of Harry Potter, to celebrate Harry Potter Book Day. This will be no ordinary lesson. We'll be creating our own magical settings, learning how to draw a magical place like Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and we'll even cast a spell or two. You don't have to read the Harry Potter books to do this lesson. All you need is a love of magic. Harry Potter Book Day is a celebration of the magic of the Harry Potter books, but it's also a celebration of the magic of reading. Personally, Harry Potter was my introduction to the magic of reading. I discovered them when I was eight years old. I had big dreams and Harry Potter really brought them to life. I basically fell into the books when I was eight years old and frankly, I have never fallen out of them. The magic of the Harry Potter books really comes to life in the way that the author J.K. Rowling describes the places Harry visits. One of the most astonishing places Harry gets to explore is Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Imagine his surprise when he first walks into the splendid Great Hall. In the story, the author describes tables laid with glittering golden plates and goblets and a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. Words are magic. They can describe a scene so vividly and create such a strong sense of atmosphere that it's almost like you're painting a picture for your reader. Using the magical places we find in Harry Potter as our inspiration, we will be coming up with ideas for writing a description of our own magical setting. The magical place you'll write about is yours to choose. Go wherever your imagination takes you. Where will you choose? It could be a vast cavernous hall just like this one with an enormous fireplace. An even better description would be a gigantic stone fireplace big enough for roaring flames to keep even the tallest giants warm. Or your place could be a secret magical station like this one, hidden in plain sight at King's Cross Station, London in the Harry Potter books. Would your station be hidden from non-magical eyes? How would people find it? Through a magical portal? And where would that portal take them? Or you might choose to describe somewhere outdoors, like a mysterious dark forest. This type of setting could have an eerie atmosphere. What strange haunting sounds can you hear in the dark? What sensations do you feel in the forest? What creatures are roaming around? Start to think about how you can build on your descriptions. For example, instead of saying the forest is very quiet, see how JK Rowling describes the Forbidden Forest in the grounds of Hogwarts in this passage. They couldn't hear anything but the rustling of leaves around them. The minutes dragged by. Their ears seemed sharper than usual. Harry seemed to be picking up every sigh of the wind, every cracking twig. Or you might want to write about somewhere a bit noisier, with a bit more life, like a magical street. Like Diagon Alley, a bustling street full of colourful shops selling everything a witch or wizard needs. first sees Diagon Alley, listen to how JK Rowling captures his sense of wonder. She doesn't just say something's amazing, she shows you exactly how amazed Harry is. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. Start thinking about how you would describe your magical setting and try to include lots of descriptive words. Think about memorable details that might make that space magical, like a starry enchanted ceiling that changes to match the weather outside, like in the Great Hall. You could use personification here, 
where we give human qualities to something which isn't human, like an object. For example, the stars winked at us as we peered up at them in amazement. Hopefully you now have a good idea of what setting you'd like to write about and can start to write some ideas down on your planning sheets. Here's a reminder of some of the things to think about when it comes to writing about your magical setting. I've shown you a few settings from the world of Harry Potter, but now let your imaginations run wild and invent your own. Before you turn your ideas into a description of your setting, I'm going to read you a little extract from the first Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. This will show you how describing a place and the magical objects in it can paint an unforgettable picture in your reader's mind. Harry had never even imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles, which were floating in mid-air over four long tables where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, the ghosts shone misty silver. Mainly to avoid all the staring eyes, Harry looked upwards and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, it's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts of History. It was hard to believe there was a ceiling there at all, and that the Great Hall didn't simply open onto the heavens. Now let's look at the little writing tips and tricks from that extract that will help you write descriptive sentences to make your setting magical. Firstly, we can add adjectives to describe nouns in greater detail. Colors are good starting blocks for adjectives, but J.K. Rowling adds another adjective in front of a colour to give an even clearer sense of what she's describing. For example, the ceiling of the Great Hall is a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. Describing the appearances of the ghosts, she writes, the ghosts shone misty silver. You can also use figurative language like personification, which we covered earlier, alliteration, similes and metaphors. Alliteration is where you repeat the sound of the start of a word to make your descriptions more interesting, like when J.K. Rowling writes, glittering golden plates and goblets. A simile is a comparison of one thing with another thing of a different kind. For example, when the author compares hundreds of faces looking like pale lanterns. Lastly, you could use a metaphor, which is when something is described as being something else. For example, you could write, the Great Hall is the heart of Hogwarts. While you're planning your writing, remember to look over your ideas and think about how you can improve them. You can add lots of different elements to your writing, much like a potion. The more bold and ambitious you are with your vocabulary, the more exciting your writing will be. If you chose to write about a street, for example, look at all the detail you can add to make that description as interesting as it can be. You could add some alliteration using adjectives, the cluttered cobblestone alley. Then we could add a simile, the cluttered cobblestone alley meandered like a stream. Next, we could add some personification. The leaded windows of the overhanging buildings were peering down. Finally, we could use our senses to describe what we see, smell or hear. The cluttered cobblestone alley meandered like a stream and the air around it was thick with the sounds of jingling, rustling and chitter chatter. The leaded windows of the overhanging buildings were peering down at the mysterious cloaked people moving in and out of them, running errands and window shopping. 
So now it's time to pick up your quills or your pens, take all your notes and ideas and turn them into a passage of writing. Good luck with your writing and keep going. Remember that the power of words is that you can pluck things from your imagination and make them come to life. You are creating a brand new, never before seen magical place. So have fun with it. As Professor Dumbledore, headmaster of Hogwarts, says to Harry in the final book in the series, of course it is happening inside your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it's not real? I'll see you in a moment for our next activity. and I'm here at Warner Brothers Studio Tour London, The Making of Harry Potter. In this activity, with an expert's help, we're all going to draw a magical Harry Potter location and learn how to create our own magical place. As illustrator of some of the Harry Potter books, Johnny Duddle has brought some of the most beloved characters and locations from Harry Potter to life. Welcome Johnny, I'm sure it's not your first time you've been to Leavesden Studios, you're intimately familiar with all the world of Harry Potter. Um, yeah, I came with my daughter when I was working on the book covers. Um, I think when I just finished, we came to look around. Amazing. And you're going to teach me, us, to draw today, hopefully. Um, what, are, what are we going to learn to draw today? We're going to try and draw Hogwarts okay. School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. In the book, it says it's, a, it's a, a huge castle. They see it from across the lake the first time, and it's on a cliff, and it's high above them, and they, they approach it in the boats. So I wanted it to look sort of tall and, and, and magical, but also, it has to fit on the cover when you're doing a book cover, so of it's going to fit in this space here, so it's going to be a long way away. Um, and I looked at pictures of castles and places I visited. I take a lot of photographs of castles and things when I visit, and um, St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall and Oxford, and I looked at all these sort of places and mm. collected lots of pictures, and that kind of inspired that design. Even though it's quite sort of small on the book cover, it inspired the sort of design of it. And was it very clear in your head before you went to draw it? Um, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes when you, you just start drawing and see what happens. So yeah. you have an, an idea of what you want it to look like and you just draw. And that's what I've been doing since I was a kid. You just start, think about what you want it to look like vaguely and you start drawing it. And sometimes you get ideas while you're drawing. Yeah. So you keep adding bits to it and it becomes this magical castle. Nice. So where shall we start? Um, because it's, an, like, it's, it's a cliff and they go across in the lake, I kind of thought it's easier to start with the lake and mm -hmm. it's a straight line. So. If we start Perfect. at the bottom and just kind of build up, so we'll start with the lake, okay. then go to the cliff and just start adding bits of castle and bits of Hogwarts Amazing. as we draw. Okay. So the first thing is quite low down, because you want it all to fit on the piece of paper, um, is to just draw a kind of straight line with a few lines. A in. straight line. <laughs> straight line with some wavy bits, because it's a lake. Of course, of course. And we don't have to be perfect, do no, we? No, it doesn't have to be perfect. Right, shall I go? I don't yeah. know why I'm scared to draw on this. Let's, let's... Mm, Start. There. And then, because it's on like a cliff, it's drawing lots of sort of rocks. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the shape of the rocks are. You want it. So I sort of just started off drawing sort of like a, a lump in the water, like that. Which, and then you can just plonk Hogwarts on top of it and just start building on top. So just a and that's what jaggedy, we have to think about. messy, sort of rocky lump. And a rock that will hold an entire magical castle. Yeah. So. And the shape can be different to mine. And if children are drawing it, they can draw any shape they like. Great. Um, and then, when I started drawing this the first time, I sort of thought about it. They come across in the lake. So if you kind of you'd have a, um, a little jetty, which can just be a line with sort of poles sort of holding, the, holding that up. What's a jetty? The thing that boats tie to. OK. You know, okay. like a wooden thing in the water that boats tie to. Um, and then there's apparently a boathouse. One thing I notice about you, Johnny, is because you're an illustrator, such confident, bold strokes. I feel like as a, as a non-drawer, there's a bit of me that's like, it has to be perfect, but he's just going for it. We'll tidy it up later, right? My, yeah, well, my, especially for rough drawings and for getting ideas, I draw things quite quickly, and the drawings often go wrong anyway. Yeah. Um, so oh, really? normally if I draw something like this, I wouldn't draw it on such a big piece of paper, I'd draw it on a small piece of paper, and I'd probably draw it quite a few times until I got it right. Okay. It wouldn't be necessarily right the I first love time. that, yeah. And then when they get here, they kind of go up some steps, so you can just draw some zigzags and then draw little lines on. Zigzags. And they go up the steps to 
So they don't have to look. Sometimes just making marks look, makes things look like steps because you, you imagine what's there rather than actually really being able to see it. Uh -huh. And then this gets a bit complicated when you're drawing it at a funny angle, but when you draw at home, you draw kind of looking at the piece of paper like this. Yes. But, um, when you draw buildings, you have to think about perspective. Oh um, but perspective is quite complicated and it takes a little while to learn to do it properly. Uh -huh. So we'll just draw it, and if it's a bit wonky, it and doesn't perspective really matter. is like the distance, things going off in the distance. Yeah, and like the shape. If you look at something, then the shape of the, the, the angles, the walls go up, make it look more 3D. So if I draw, when they get up here, they go in the entrance hall. Oh, so if you draw two lines, but this is, it doesn't matter if it's not possible. When you draw things that look that's, like... That's sort of the... Oh, yeah, the entrance hall. Like, oh, yeah. where the first two's all arrived. I'm going to draw a roof on it, because it's the entrance hall and a door. Look how quickly Hogwarts is coming together. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> You've lost me. So if that one, if you go down at an angle here... Uh -huh. And a roof. Oh, I think I've made my Hogwarts too it's tall. Fine. It doesn't matter. It'll be a, <laughs> Are it's we a really the big. It's going to be the, the Great Hall, and it'll yeah. be a really big Great Hall. Okay. And then you'd so have kind that. of windows and things, but because it's sketched, windows, you know, in, in the in the Great Hall and things, they have lots of very tall windows, like in churches and, and in universities. You yeah. can just kind of draw lines, and they kind of start looking like windows. Ah, okay. And same for tiles on the roof, but you can do all the details later. It's just, and then you can just start adding other towers and turrets. So there could be, um, like on the cliff, there could be a, a castley bit with a pointy. Castley bit. Like a, you could do castle edges on. I like how you just say something and your imagination goes, ta da! Cas a castle bit. <laughs> a castle bit. And then it's like a circle so here. So it looks like a mushroom. Like a very flat circle, yeah, a very pointy mushroom. Yeah. And it needs like lots it. of pointy mushrooms on, on Hogwarts. So, um, and there could be, a, it's, what you need to do is just start adding lots of these sort of things. So, okay. so more roofs and more turrets and more pointy bits. And I suppose the odder, the wackier the shapes, yeah. the more magical it's going to And it doesn't be. have to look like the one on my book cover or ones in right. the films. It can look like, well, as an illustrator, when you draw something, um, you kind of, it's, it's how you see it. So you yes. read the book yes. and then you imagine what it's like in your head and you try and draw it. And the children should just draw things like that. Like, yeah. if they think Hogwarts looks different, that doesn't matter. Just kind of add the things you think it looks like, like a yeah. pointy tower. So if you just start adding, um, you know, more tall bits, more tall buildings with pointy roofs, um, more windows, um, and it could have bits sticking off the side. But again, this gets a bit more sort of perspective-y. I think the lesson you can take from my drawing is that Hogwarts is massive <laughs> and that uh, you should do it smaller, for, like, like what, how you're doing to scale. What you could do, and what I do a lot at home, because a lot of time when you draw a character, you might draw it, start drawing it, think it looks really good, and then as you go on, it kind of, you've run out of space on the paper. I have. Yeah, what you can always do is add another piece on top. Oh, yeah. So you just stick another piece, especially with Hogwarts, you could end up having sticking lots and lots of pieces on top of each other and just yes. keep adding bits of Hogwarts to it. That's a great um, idea. So we have another. Oh my goodness. How have you just made that look real? <laughs> you made that look so convincing, wow. And then it can have more rocks. But I, sort of st I just keep adding to the drawing and then going back over the bits I like in the drawing. Um, and you could, there's obviously the, is it the Great Tower? There's a really big pointy tower. Yeah. Um, with the staircase and everything. So you could add that in and then slowly, that, so a bit like this, another big pointy mushroom with a bit pointy bit, but you've not got a lot of space. You maybe do it to one side, off the side here or off the side there. Actually, I'm running out of space as well. It's a very short. Oh, that's I think last time one. I drew it, it was much taller. And to make it look really big, you could have little windows and things on it and um, extra bits. Well, I'll just draw them here. It doesn't matter where they go, you see, you can put more towers here, more bits of yeah. castle, more sort of... Um, and, if, and often when I draw something, like I said, the first time it's not necessarily right, so I'll look at it and think, oh, what do I want to change the next one? I'll draw it again, sort of slightly differently. 
Oh, yeah. Um, and, um, so you sort of learn from each drawing each, that you yeah, do. Yeah, so I'll draw, every That's time cool. I do something, I tend to draw it, well, sometimes if I draw a character or a design something, I can draw it 20 times before I like, you know, I'm really happy with the one that I use in a book or on a on a yeah. illustration. Um, and also, it's a bit weird drawing from the side, so you sometimes have to kind of look at it <laughs> straight on That's a bit. my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes, it goes really wonky when you draw it from the side. <laughs> So you just need lots more towers. I lots just pointy need more bits. towers. Lots more pointy bits, towers. Um, you could draw the, there's the big viaducty thing. I'm not entirely oh. sure what everything's called, which you could have going off, off the, off the side of the paper. And that's just like a couple of lines with some big, and then you could have more rocks over there. So it looks like the, the, it's going off the picture. Yeah. See, that's okay. And then if you go down that angle there, yeah. And then it can kind of just be ah. stuck on the side. You can have a bottom to it and sort of legs holding it up. Yes. But especially with Hogwarts, because it's this huge magical castle, you could just, like I say, stick another piece of paper and just keep drawing, adding bits, more and more towers, more and more things. It doesn't need to look like my one or the film one. It can be your idea of what Hogwarts should look like. Um, and there's particular places like the, add more the greenhouses, more rock, you could yeah. do this sort of thing, or you could have um, a dragon. Oh, you draw, can a, we dragon, do a, dragon? draw a dragon Come on the top. So again, like, like the castle, um, it doesn't necessarily have to look really like a detailed dragon. You okay. could do just, so a dragon has a pointy nose with horns, and that's just a squiggle, and then a long curvy neck. Because you're so far away from the thing, it kind of looks, and it can have his claws on, and then a long tail coming off. Spikes, maybe, and some oh, wings. I love that. And it kind of looks like a dragon, even though it's not a really detailed dragon. That, I don't know how like you a dragon. I, I just blinked and a dragon appeared. That's so cool. So, so you can draw, you, you, I mean, you can do more detail, but that's kind of. Especially when, like, I normally draw a small one, when you just want it to look like a dragon from a distance. My and it just needs a tail massive, going somewhere. Yeah. And maybe some, yeah, it's a much bigger dragon. And same with Hogwarts, you just keep adding bits. I'm going to have some more towers. And then when I do a book cover, this is normally how I start off. I start drawing it very quickly and doing lots of sketches, ah. and I do quite a lot of sketches. And then I normally colour mine in on, the, on a computer, but it's kind of the same way. I use a special pen, um, and I just photograph or scan my pit drawing and mm -hmm. just start colouring it in, and maybe adding more bits of castle and more extra bits. You just need another big piece of paper so you can do a really tall tower. <laughs> Get the tower in there. Yeah. Bit of fire. Oh, fire. <laughs> Add some drama. Some and also, we're drawing, we're drawing it in kind of a blue as well. I sometimes use yeah. black, sometimes use blue, sometimes use orange. You could, if we had other pencils, we could always do lots of orangey, flamey bits. And yeah. Colour in a bit so you know that's the dragon. We could shade bits to make them look more 3D. Oh. Does that look like Hogwarts? Vaguely Absolutely. like Hogwarts. Like a Hogwarts, like my Hogwarts. Like I say, is it, when, when you read a book, it's your interpretation. It's what you think something looks like is what's important, not necessarily what you've seen before. And that's art, isn't it? It's like just adding your perspective, yeah. your flavour, your touch. I felt the same way about like, you know, playing Luna. Anyone else would play her uh, their way, a different mm. way. But like, that's the exciting thing as an artist, that you get to kind of get your flavour, your perspective to yeah, the world. Which makes it kind of unique. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't know how many more to add. <laughs> more dragons! <laughs> more dragons. <laughs> oh, uh, Harry, in his little boat. Can you you could a do a boat, boat? although it'd have to be to scale, it'd be very little. So a, yeah, a rowing boat, if you're doing a rowing boat, it would, well, I'd, if it's going towards there, you'd have a little back bit of the boat, then a pointy sort of. Okay. That's kind of roughly what a boat looks like. Oh, with oars. And then it's so small, my pencil's gone so stubby, it just <laughs> had to be the shape of a sort of. Bigger. I'm not sure who was in the boat. Harry. I I'm going to do Harry and Hagrid. So Hagrid would be much bigger with lots of hair. Maybe he's rowing. And that's Harry. Harry. And he's got his broomstick. Oh. <laughs> and then Hagrid. 
and then a bit you could draw little bits of water sort of where it's come from if you've got space it's meant to be Hagrid and Harry <laughs> so that's very quick Hogwarts oh I love it it's brilliant I love that Harry's entrance to Hogwarts starts with a fire breathing dragon <laughs> how good would that have been <laughs> Wow. I mean, you look like you could just walk into that and that gives you such a clear idea of, of the world that you're creating. I mean, just even seeing that sketch informs, for, for everyone watching, it informs the rest of your world. You can, it starts to trigger more ideas about what you can write, what you can, can create. It's just very exciting to see like your mind, your imagination spill out onto the page. Yeah, drawing normally does sort of trigger more yes. ideas. You draw something once and then it gives you an idea for something else and then it gives you an idea for something else. So yes. the more, more bits you draw, the more ideas you get. Yeah. And if you just sit and look at it, look at a blank piece of paper, it's quite hard. But if you just start yeah. drawing, something then you happens. get ideas. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you for um, this amazing lesson and, and for, um, well, getting me back into the habit of drawing. It is actually quite fun when you don't overthink it, when, you're, when you just go for it and don't, uh, <laughs> don't try and be perfect. Whatever you like to draw, remember you can use Johnny's tips and tricks to help you with your artwork at school and at home. If you enjoyed this lesson, why not use these techniques to draw the imaginary magical place you created from our first activity? Now let's move on to our third and final activity. Learning spells is one of the most important and fun parts of a young witch or wizard's education. They come in handy for absolutely everything. Today, we're here at Warner Brothers Studio Tour London, The Making of Harry Potter, and we're going to have a go at learning some of the spells that every witch or wizard is taught in charms class during their time at Hogwarts. To help us, we're joined by Paul Harris, who invented the spell casting movements in the film Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Hello, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Ivana. As you know, we go way back. I think we joined the films at the very same time, Order of the Phoenix. We did, indeed. And you yeah. were my first uh, charms teacher. Uh, you were my first spell deliverer as well. Paul is here to show us the spell casting positions he created when working on the films. Even basic spells can be a little tricky to master. Harry and Ron find this out during a charms lesson in their first year. Now don't forget that nice wrist movement we've been practicing, squeaked Professor Flitwick, perched on top of his pile of books as usual. Swish and flick, remember? Swish and flick. And saying the magic words properly is very important too. Ron, at the next table, wasn't having much more luck. Wingardium Leviosa, he shouted, waving his long arms like a windmill. You're saying it wrong, Harry heard Hermione snap. It's Wingardium Leviosa. Make the gar nice and long. You do it then if you're so clever, Ron snarled. Hermione rolled up the sleeves of her gown, flicked her wand and said, Wingardium Leviosa. Their feather rose off the desk and hovered about four feet above their heads. Oh, well done, cried Professor Flitwick, clapping. Everyone see here, Miss Granger's done it. Ron was in a very bad temper by the end of the class. Hermione must have been paying attention. Paul is going to show us the positions to take when casting spells today. We're then going to have some fun making up actions to go with each spell. First, Paul is going to introduce each spell to us and talk about its effects before casting. You and I will then cast straight after Paul to get used to how to say each spell and the wand movement. So let's all get to our feet and be ready to cast spells when I tell you to. Thank you very much, Mr. Wandmaster. So, Paul, which spells are we going to be learning today? The first spell is Wingardium Leviosa. Um, this spell levitates objects, which means to rise and float in the air. Very nice. And as I remember, there is a specific movement to it. Well, I'm going to use position three for this. So I'm going to bring the arm across and then bring the wand arm under the body. And don't forget the all important swish and flick. So as you Make this movement, say the name of the spell. Three, two, one. Wingardium Leviosa. Oh, my wand work is a little rusty. <laughs> Let's go again. It. One more time. Arm across the body. And is Bring that it. like a defensive mechanism? It is, but okay. we're mainly focused on delivering the spell today. Okay. But we're going to use this because we can really highlight the swish and flip rotation. Bring Very the arm nice. across the body. Three, 
two, one. Wingardium Leviosa. I think that worked. I think it worked very well. I can see a, a levitating object right there. So the next spell is Reducio, which um, is a shrinking spell. So for this, we're going to use position two. So bring your wand arm forward and get your body a little bit into the, um, the delivery of the spell, but still don't forget the all important swish and flick. And it comes from the wrist or the shoulder? Exa well, it comes from the whole being of the wizard, right, right through the body, right through the arm, into the, uh, the delivery of the spell. A true so, master here. Through. Make sure that you try it with us. So, so you need to get up, get active. It's quite, it's quite involved, this, as you say. It's a full body. The movement. whole body. There has to be something that makes one wizard better than another. So here we go. Three, okay. two, one. Reducio. Reducio. Three, two, one. Reducio. Reducio. Oh, look, it worked. Everyone at home is very tiny. <laughs> <laughs> so our next spell is Incendio, which creates fire. Yes. And for this, we're going to use position one, which is above the head. So we're going to create a nice clean curve above the head, aiming the wand at the target, still always using the swish and flick, inverted rotation of the wrist. Bring the wand forward and swish it back. Three, two, one, Incendio! Whoa. You might not have been able to hear that at home, but I just heard a whipping noise from your wand. Swish the and flick. power, yeah. Here we go. One more time above the head, nice clean curve. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Incendio. Incendio! So the next spell is Petrificus Totalus, which makes a person freeze in place. I remember this one from the first movie. They performed it on good old Neville Longbottom. Do you remember wow. this? Wow, <laughs> you're an encyclopedia of information. <laughs> so well, this one we're going to use position four, which is bringing the wand into the small of the back, but still remembering the swish and flick. So even though it's behind the back, and even though it's in the small of the back, that's it, exactly. Okay. So we're going to bring the wand in the small of the back, say the name of the spell, aim at the target, mm -hmm. three, two, one. one. Petrificus totalis. totalis! I can't get that whip sound. It sounds so great from yours. I can't do it. Got to practice. Shall we do that one again? Yeah. Three, two, one. Petrificus, Petrificus totalis. totalis. It's hard not to turn it into a dance move. Ah, well, it's funny you should <laughs> say that because our final spell is Tarantalegra, which causes uncontrollable dancing. There you go. Aimed at the legs and causes uncontrollable dancing movements. Tarantalegra. 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 So You're we're going to turn our body, that. we're going to use position five for this. Turn our body to the left and fire the spell behind you. Exactly. Okay, make sure you get involved at home. This is quite difficult. This is your, your chance to practice your, your wand work. Well, he, so here we go. The target is there, Kay. the legs are there. Uncontrollable dancing. Three, two, two one. one. Tarantalegra. I can't help doing my jazz hands. <laughs> what are you doing with your hands? I'm, well, I'm bringing mine across my body in case I need to defend myself. I mean, we have no one attacking us th at this uh, moment, but okay. it's possible that you might. Okay, maybe jazz hands are my signature flair for this one. With white gloves. <laughs> Three, two, one. Tarantalegra! Tarantalegra. Now we're going to imagine the effect of each spell by performing a corresponding action. In our first run through, I'll show you one way you can interpret each spell's effect. So try copying me. Paul, if you will. So here we go, the first one. Wingardium Leviosa. That's as high as I can and go. Reducio. <laughs> Incendio. Ah, I'm on fire. <laughs> Petrificus Totalis. The best one! I wish I could Irish dance, I never actually learned. It's quite tiring this one. I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> now let's try that again, but quicker. See if you can keep up at home. Wingardium Leviosa! Reducio! Incendio! <laughs> Petrificus Totalis! Tantalegra! This is my favourite one. <laughs> I think you just keep going. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have not lost your touch, Paul. You are a true master of charms, and I will continue to practice, I promise. Thank you, and it's so lovely to see you again. Likewise.
What a fun way to discover some of the most important spells that Harry, Ron and Hermione encounter during their time at Hogwarts. I really hope you've enjoyed our Harry Potter lesson, whether you've read Harry Potter before or not. Above all else, we've discovered that the magic of books can transport you to special places. Whatever you read, write, draw and imagine, remember, anything's possible if you've got enough nerve. Thank you.